we see Governor Christie coming out now. Here we uh, go. Approaching. There he is. There he is. And I will ask the control room if you want to go to Christie now. Yeah, let's just go to it now. Thank you, control room. yesterday. Um, I, we were up in Rochester yesterday, and it was snowing, like real New Hampshire snow. Um, so it was good to experience that. So thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your support. You know, we start these town halls the same way. I started them the same way ever since we were up at St. Anselm's in June to tell you why, why we're in this race. And we're in this race to tell the truth. From the beginning, we've been in this race to tell the truth. Fact is that as we were watching this race come together, from where Mary Pat and I were sitting at home in New Jersey, we were really concerned that nobody would tell the truth in this race about what's really at stake. And no one would tell the truth about Donald Trump. No one would tell the truth about his divisiveness, his stoking of anger for his own benefit, him putting himself before the people of this country, myself included, who gave him the honor of being President of the United States from 2017 to 2021. Personal ambition is a necessary element for any political candidate. You gotta get out of bed in the morning and be able to really believe in your heart that you have something to offer to folks that's better and different. And so I have no argument with people who are involved in politics being ambitious. You need to have it. But it can't be what governs your decision making. Ambition can't be what makes you decide how to do things as a public figure. It could just be the fuel that gets you out of bed, that gets you in front of a room like this, that gets you on the phone raising money, that gets you working for people who you believe in and gets you working for yourself. I made a political decision eight years ago when I dropped out of the race in 2016. I looked at the polls and I decided that Donald Trump was gonna be the nominee and that since I'd known him for 15 years, that I could make him a better candidate, and if he won, maybe a better president. I knew his flaws, but I also knew he was gonna win the nomination. So I decided that I would get behind him and support him. I let the ambition get ahead and in control of the decision-making. And after I figured that out, I promised myself and I promised my wife that I would never, ever do that again. And I'm not going to. So for all the people who have been in this race, who have put their own personal ambition ahead of what's right, they will ultimately have to answer the same questions that I had to answer after my decision in 2016. Those questions don't ever leave. In fact, they're really stubborn. They stay. And so I know how I'm answering those questions. I've never believed that Donald Trump was a foregone conclusion as our nominee in this race. And I knew that the case had to be made against him. Now there are people in our party who are resigned 
the fact that he was going to be the nominee, resigned with the fact that the case didn't even need to be made because it would be a waste of time. They sat on the sidelines, and all they did was voice their opposition in private, behind closed doors, quietly, so no one could hear. And that's not leadership, everybody. That's cowardice. It's cowardice and it's hypocrisy. As a party, we need to be willing to take the responsibility for the part we've played in getting here. Our country is angry, it's divided, it's accomplishing little, and it is leading our citizens to be exhausted. And you just look at what's happening just in the last few days. Good people who got into politics, I believe, for the right reasons. People like Senator John Barrasso, people like Congressman Tom Emmer, stand up and endorse Donald Trump. They know better. I know they know better. People who continue to deny the results of the 2020 election. People in leadership in the House who go on TV and say that the people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th are hostages. I'll tell you who hostages are. The Israelis who are still being hidden in tunnels in Gaza against their will, out of no fault of their own. These people speak louder for the folks who attacked our Capitol on January 6th than they are willing to stand up and speak for the people of Israel who are in tunnels in Gaza. That's not leadership. That's ambition and cowardice which has outstripped their otherwise good judgment. We wanna change this party and if we wanna change this country, it's hard work. It's not easy. From the moment I got into the race, the decision that I made was really simple. I would rather lose by telling the truth than lie in order to win. And I feel no differently today because this is a fight for the soul of our party and the soul of our country. Why have we resisted the calls to drop out of this race? Because unlike some of the other candidates, we're fighting for something bigger than ourselves. We're fighting for something bigger than self-interest. We're fighting for something bigger than the next title. I've got plenty of titles. I have enough titles to last me the rest of my life. U.S. Attorney, Governor, Husband, father, son, brother. I had enough titles to last me for the rest of my life. We're fighting for something bigger. And it's something that conventional wisdom thinkers just can't possibly understand. And so they've been saying for weeks and weeks and weeks, because of some polls that I should drop out of the race, that I should get out for that reason. The smallness of the campaigns, who spend more time arguing and worrying about who should get out of the race than they have spent going after the front runner. They spend all their time saying, oh, Christie should get out, Scott should get out, Pence should get out, Hutchinson should get out, Burgum should get out. They and their donors have a different target every day to try to minimize the attention to their own campaign. And how their own campaign is a campaign that doesn't play to win. It's a campaign that plays to not offend. The problems in our country, the divisions and influx at our border, the problems with our enormous debt, the failures of our education system, 
all of those things and much more will not be solved by people who are too afraid to talk about what the real problems are. If we ever have a hope of restoring this party to be a governing party of principles, we have to be willing to do the hard work and take some of the heat that comes with it. We have candidates in this race who have run away from forums where they were afraid they were gonna be booed. I run into the forums where I know I'm gonna be booed because being booed for telling the truth is a badge of honor. I'm proud of everything we've said and done so far. And I'm proud of all the people who have supported us and are willing to do what needs to be done to restore the soul of our country. See, because in the end, all those issues that we've talked about at all the town halls, they're all really important. But they're no more important than the most important issue. And that is the character of the candidate. You don't know what's gonna come across the next president's desk. You think you can predict it, but you can't. No one asked George W. Bush or Al Gore what they would do if four airliners were hijacked and flown into symbols of American power and killing thousands of Americans. No one asked them that in New Hampshire in 2000. But I was glad we had a man of character sitting behind the desk in the Oval Office when that attack came, because I knew George Bush would do everything he needed to do to protect this country and its people and put them first, not himself first. Imagine just for a moment if 9-11 had happened with Donald Trump behind the desk. The first thing he would have done was run to the bunker to protect himself. He would have put himself first before this country. And anyone who is unwilling to say that he is unfit to be president of the United States is unfit themselves to be president of the United States. Campaigns are run to win. That's why we do them. I see the chairman here in New Hampshire, he knows. We run campaigns to win. My goal has never been to be just a voice against the hate and the division and the selfishness of what our party has become under Donald Trump. It's also been to win the nomination and defeat Joe Biden and restore our party and our country to a new place of hope and optimism in this country. I've always said that there came a point in time in this race where I couldn't see a path to accomplishing that goal that I would get out. And it's clear to me tonight that there isn't a path for me to win the nomination, which is why I'm suspending my campaign tonight for President of the United States. I know, and I can see it from some of the faces here, that I'm disappointing some people by doing this. People who believe in our message and believe in what we've been doing. I also know, though, it's the right thing for me to do. Because I wanna promise you this, I am gonna make sure that in no way do I enable Donald Trump to ever be president of the United States again. And that's more important than my own personal ambition. An announcement, an apology, and a mini essay on the dangers of unprincipled ambition, all from former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie announcing he is suspending his campaign for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Mara Gillespie and Chuck Rocha join me now here at the table. Mara previously served as an advisor to former House Speaker John Boehner and Congressman Adam Kinzinger. She's now founder of Blue Stack Strategies. Chuck is a Democratic strategist who serves as the president of Solidarity Strategies. He was an advisor for Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign. Mara, it is... Of course, my obligation to start with you as the resident Republican at the mm -hmm. table. Your thoughts, and your fellow reaction. fellow New Jerseyan. Yes, so. fellow New Jerseyan. I didn't know that, but I know that now. So I'm, I'm glad to see this. I think it's the time to do so. Why are you glad? I think what Chris Christie's goal has always been was to, even though he said it was to win, was also to ensure that Trump didn't get the nomination. And at this point, he's seeing the poll numbers. 
And Nikki Haley has, you know, really closed the gap between her and Trump as far as New Hampshire goes. And with him pulling in at around 12 percent, those numbers going to Nikki Haley, which I believe a large chunk of them would go to her, that puts her ahead of Donald Trump in New Hampshire. So it's a beneficial time. Um, and then you kind of look and see where does it go from there as far as Nevada, South Carolina, Michigan. Um, and I think this is the time to do it. I don't think that he's going to throw his support behind Nikki Haley right now. Uh, he's made that kind of clear that he's not interested in doing that. But those who are supporting Chris Christie are going to look for a candidate that's going to be firm on our foreign policy, that's going to stand up uh, and differentiate from Donald Trump. And right now, who's left in the race to do that? But Nikki Haley. And so from your perspective, even if Chris Christie doesn't say, I endorse Nikki Haley, whether that's tomorrow, the next day, the day after the Iowa caucuses, mm -hmm. most of those New Hampshire supporters who were thinking about Chris Christie will do the math themselves? Well, and I, I think and, they, and, and, and shift to Haley. I think they will shift to Haley if if they don't shift to Biden. You know, there are probably some of those who may shift back to Biden. So it's not a guarantee that the, that twelve percent will go to her, but it, it won't go to another candidate in the GOP field. Right. It? it won't go to DeSantis. It won't Correct. go to anywhere else. So it may not be Nikki Haley plus twelve from right. Chris Christie. It may be plus eight. But I think but, a large chunk of it could go to her. Right. And that's a benefit to her. And what she needs, and what any candidate mm -hmm. needs in the closing days of a contested battle for the nomination, is you need to be adding, not subtracting. Absolutely. And you believe this will help add for Nikki Haley, at least in New Hampshire. Yes. How about, and I want to ask you this, because you can find this in the polls, and you can certainly find it when you talk to Republicans outside of New Hampshire, South Carolina would be the next most important mm -hmm. place. They can't stand Chris Christie, and they're not going to listen to him no matter what, especially when he dumps on Trump. So it's beneficial that he doesn't endorse Nikki Haley, right, in that scenario as well. So, again, I think what he talked about um, as far as ambition shouldn't be what governs your decision making. I wish <laughs> that message would get out there to everyone who's looking to run for office or is currently in the House GOP. As we've seen today, uh, ambition seems to be what uh, driving factor for a lot of members. Um, but as far as this race, the GOP field, I think what he is trying to get at is that Donald Trump can't be our candidate, and I hope that those who are supporting him uh, will will turn towards Nikki Haley. Chuck, your sentiments as you watch this play out. You know, I've been running campaigns for a long time, and I've been on both sides of this, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the numbers just don't add up. It's just math. Mm -hmm. And he's doing what he's been saying he'd do from the beginning is try to do what he can do to make sure Donald Trump's not the nominee. And that's what you have to do today if your numbers are where they're at. Is now the time to do it? I think so, because as you go into Iowa, I know we've all been talking about New Hampshire because mm -hmm. independents can vote, Democrats can vote. In Iowa, I heard you talking to uh, the crew earlier on the ground there in the freezing tundra of <laughs> Iowa, where I remember a year ago in this same cowboy hat, me and Ed O'Keefe was having an interview while uh, Bernie was running, mm -hmm. right? It's cold. It takes a lot to show up when it's minus five. I think that's right. what Finn said. A, l a few people make a lot of difference in Iowa because mm -hmm. it's so few people. And y'all talk about viability. Mm -hmm. I saw the tutor, the class you were doing, the tutorial earlier about how to become viable. A number here and a number there mm -hmm. changes things with just like three people, mm -hmm. not hundreds of people like you need or thousands in New Hampshire. So every little bit starts adding up. And where this caucus goes, Iowa, New Hampshire, or even down the roads of South Carolina, mm -hmm. A few hundred votes, a few thousand votes make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So you think this could have a psychological lift for Haley, but not DeSantis? This is, this is a Haley conversation. The Chris Christie out is a Haley conversation. Presidential campaigns are about momentum mm -hmm. and always about momentum. I try to tell people all the time when they're like, well, what happened to Bernie and what happened with Biden? Biden won races on Super Tuesday that he had no staff in four years ago because the momentum was just with him. That same momentum today is with Nikki Haley. Very good. Chuck Rocha, Mara Gillespie, thank you so much for your time.